Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Matt Brown Show. This is the Private Placement Perspective Series, where we're talking about, you guessed it, private placements in the world of venture capital. So with us on the, on the line today is Jeremy uh, Wallace from New Form Capital. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, listen, so I've had a chance to get to know you and that kind of stuff. Very curious to get uh, your story shared with uh, my audience. So why don't you kick us off with a bit about your background? Like, how did you get a, your start in the world of venture capital? And um, tell us what New Form Cap's up to. Absolutely. I'll, I'll give a quick background on myself and dive into to our fund and what we focus on. Um, I got into the entrepreneurial world uh, right out of college. I've had two failed startups, um, and, and I transitioned to private equity from there. Um, I had an opportunity to work at a large buyout fund. Um, found you know that certainly interesting, just you know nowhere near as as creative as early stage investing. Um, then moved over to a family office that also owned a financial services business. Um, spent you know roughly around three years there before moving over to New Form. New Form, really, what we focus on is fintech applications within blockchain and crypto. Um, so what that means is you know we don't invest in NFTs, um, decentralized internet. Certainly believe in those things. It's just not within our thesis. Um, really, you know, our, our thesis is financial applications, blockchains used for, for transfer of value. So all of our LPs come from traditional Wall Street backgrounds. And the, the three buckets that we focus on are infrastructure, you know, two being DeFi and then three pretty broad term, but we're calling it a blockchain based securities. Very, very cool. Um, so lots to unpack there. So <clears throat> who do you typically back? I mean, what stage of startup are you looking at? Are you looking at uh, st- some uh, sort of, you know, revenue generating on the blockchain? Or have you just built a platform or, or, you know, you're in the process of building it? So what stage of startup are you looking to back? And what sort of check size are you looking to cut? Yeah, so our, our sweet spot is seed stage. Um, and, and our average check size is right around a million bucks. That flexes down and up. Um, we we do do pre-seed as well, um, but with you know the understanding that we'll be able to to follow on in, in the subsequent rounds um, to to get up to that million um, and, and probably you know one or two Series A. But that's valuation sensitive. Um, so seed, you know, really anywhere from idea on a napkin. $5 million cap um, up to, you know, 40, 50 million, um, some traction, significant revenues coming in the door. Uh, um, really, you know, investing in early stage, uh, it, it's very much on, on the founders, right? Um, even if they do have significant revenues, uh, the, the life cycle of the company is so early. So um, we look at, you know, even if they have that revenue coming in the door, um, very similar process to, you know, looking at a, a founder with an idea on an, on a napkin. Cool. So what makes you guys different? I mean, what do you want to share with the world when it comes to venture capital back blockchain crypto focused funds? <laughs> what makes you guys special? Yeah. I mean, really we are highly specialized, right? So we're only investing within crypto and then within crypto, we're only looking at financial applications, Um, And and being highly specialized, you know, our our main value add is on connecting entrepreneurs from a very early stage to our limited partners, um, whether that's for providing liquidity, um, business development purposes, or, you know, executives within financial institutions that are launching crypto desks or crypto services. Um, So they get an early look to you know products that are applicable to their business um that's really where we sit it is a highly specialized thesis uh and a bridge from traditional finance to you know tr- defi um which we think is gonna you know disrupt the entire financial industry well uh on your website it literally says the <laughs> financial industry is chaotic 
and uh, on everyone's lips these days, it's uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the, and the collapse thereof. Um, so this is it's an interesting sort of event that's been happening over the last week or so in the sense of things do change things are seemingly uncertain and what was certain yesterday and 48 hours later you know 40 year old uh bank you know uh investment grade rating by the credit rating agencies 215 billion dollars in assets 48 hours later the government seizes control so (laughs) this is the world that we're living in today uh, fortunately or unfortunately, probably the latter, in my view. Um, but um, the the context here is the, the economy, right? And you know, in, this all wouldn't have happened, by the way, if uh, if interest rates hadn't gone in north and and the economy d- isn't where it is. You know, um, so what role does the macroeconomic uh, situation play in your thinking when it comes to cutting checks? Just another point to add here is. <clears throat> um, I was chatting to a, a client of mine, Otis, in uh, in New York yesterday, and they're also looking to raise their Series A. Um, and uh, and he was saying, you know, uh, the the general consensus on like the web, Twitter groups, and shit like this is that if you're a founder, like leave the VCs alone for two weeks because they're dealing with all this stuff, um, and then you know pick it up in two weeks again. And, and my view was like, well, don't wait, just keep now is the time to strike because everybody else is waiting. So. Um, anyway, that's uh, all context. So where do you land on this issue of the role of the economy in cutting checks to venture stage startups? Certainly you have to be aware of the macro environment, right? What When making an investment in an early stage, um, you know, it's ironic to say as a crypto investor, but cash is still king. Um, making sure founders are going to have adequate you know, cash on hand to, to support their operations. Um, and, and, you know, in a impeding recession or, or plateau, you know, it's unclear where we go from here. Um, but recognizing, you know, six, 12 months from now, um, additional fundraising rounds are uncertain. Um, I, I think that is the biggest, you know, driver of macro um, that, that we look at at the moment is, Later stage investors, uh, especially towards crypto, right? There were a lot of generalists that, that got in, and after FTX and, and Three Arrows and everything that's occurred in the market, they kind of pulled out of the industry. Um, so there are a smaller number of, of VCs that are doing later stage checks within crypto, um, and, and that's certainly top of mind, you know, with the economy. Um, you know, the economy comes roaring back. I, I do think we have, you know, the, those tourist investors come back to the table and some of the more institutional folks that kind of put their crypto investing on hold um, start to pick that up again. But that that's really the main component that, you know, we're paying attention to. And uh, in, in terms of writing checks, you know, valuations have certainly come down. Um, but it's kind of par for the course, right? If we find a great entrepreneur and, and we like the product, we're, we're going to get involved. Um, we, we try to stay out of the hype cycles, which are you know, quite frequent in, in crypto and you know, stay heads down and, and focus on, on you know, the task at hand. Yeah. Did you know that uh, Bitcoin jumped 20% in the last 24 hours? I did. Of course you did. Very aware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Finally, a bit of ROI coming back. You know what I mean? Hodl, people. Hodl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned LPs uh, earlier, Jeremy. When when shit like SVB goes down, how, how's and you know the economy being what it is, um, how does this affect an LP's appetite for venture stage investing in crypto, for instance? I mean, Sam Bankman Fried, SBF, SVB. You know, it's all these acronyms now flying around that that are specifically impact your space, um, or you know, lend itself to at least uh, you know impacting your your space. So LPs are obviously important for you guys to keep your your, your relationship sweet there and that kind of stuff. Um, but also, you want to raise consecutive funds. So you know, when all this shit goes down, Sam Bankman Freed and 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 you know the economy, all this kind of stuff. How does it affect their appetite for risk when it comes to venture capital? Well, I I think the FTX is quite different from SVB, but in, in general, you know, with what's occurring in banking and the various regional banks, um, it's quite clear that the current banking system has 
a number of issues that still need to be addressed. Um, and, and in terms of appetite for, you know, futuristic financial products, um, I, I don't think there's, you know, any decline there. Um, and, and on the other hand, FTX, right, um, certainly hurt the crypto industry in a big way. Um, that was more, you know, cause for, for LPs to, to, you know, take pause and, and think about their uh, portfolio allocation. I don't think it was a end-all be-all for, for a number of LPs, but it was more, okay, you know, maybe I'll keep it to 2% of the portfolio instead of, you know, 4 or 5%. Um, so it, it certainly shrunk, uh, but didn't fully cut off that, you know, capital injection from, from institutional investors. Got it. So what's the source of your deal flow typically? Uh, how do you find guys to invest in? And what are some of the key factors that you look for when evaluating uh, whether a startup is investable or not? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the majority of our deal flow these days comes from a referral basis. Um, you know, our, our fund one uh, founders, um, you know, I, I'd like to say that, you know, we, we were helpful um, in, in their journeys. And I, I'd say, you know, the, predominantly the, the majority of our deal flow comes from uh, referrals. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're involved with a number of accelerator programs and relationships with, with universities, but really our, you know, bread and butter is a founder that's been in traditional finance for call it three to five years, um, recognizes the opportunity in, in blockchain and crypto um, and takes that, you know, real world application lens, um, recognizes where this technology can be applied to, you know, create economic value, leaves their, you know, steady job at, at a, you know, larger hedge fund or, or financial institution and goes out to, to start a company. Um, you know, in that vein, we, we've backed founders from AQR, Jump, um, you know, a number of, of former investment bankers. Really, you know, given our, our thesis, um, it, we find it very helpful having, you know, a founder that, that's been in TradFi previously. Got it. So where does it go wrong? I mean, you've, you've obviously, you've just shown your portfolio to everybody uh, on YouTube, but uh, where does it go wrong? Like, obviously, these are the guys that have won. <laughs> they wouldn't be part of your portfolio, but I would suggest that there's quite a few that didn't make it. So when you get pitched, where, from your perspective as a VC, does it, does, uh, does it go wrong typically? Is there something that's a commonality between founders who've come to you for investment, pitched you, and then failed? It's a case-by-case -case basis, right? Um, you know, uh, half of VC uh, is pattern recognition um, in, in your lens or your thesis uh, of what you're looking for. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, point to specifics because every case it, it is different. But um, a huge thing for, for us is you know, having a, an addressable market or, or a product that can go to market quickly. Um, B2B in crypto is certainly a bit more difficult. Um, so, you know, and, and for the most part, you know, retail still dominates the, the crypto industry. So that's certainly something that, that we pay close attention to. Uh, do you want an example of, you know, portfolio company you know, not doing so well, or what exactly did you want me to uh, expand upon there? Hey, it's your show, bro. This is called the Map Round Show for placeholders. <laughs> no, I guess it, it's just, you know, it, it's nice to know from a VC's perspective where it goes wrong. So, like, for instance, what oftentimes happens, it's kind of like you don't actually have a problem to solve, you're yeah. looking for one. Another one is uh, your projections are way too aggressive. You know, I've had, I know one <clears throat> one investor has made put over a billion dollars into a hundred investments, and not one of those hundred investments has made uh, their numbers or met their targets. You know, so it's just when you're pitching to VC, <clears throat> you don't want to repeat the sins of others. Absolutely, I I think for for me, you know, obviously product market fit is cr crucial, but also founder market fit, right? 
Um, if you know you're an individual that's creating a lending product, um, having a background or some exposure to that market previously, um, you know, for for example, um, I, I think there are a lot of folks that are, are, can recognize problems, right? But um, when it comes to founders, you know, you really want to back the ones that are in the best position to to execute um, and, and you know let those ideas come to, to, to fruition. Um, that, that's certainly something that I, I pay attention to more and more. Mm, yeah, it's, um, it's good. It's good, really good advice. Speaking of advice, what, what is one piece of advice you would give to a startup founder looking to raise capital today? I mean, obviously given the, the, the macro backdrop, understand that you know things might not move as as quickly um as as they did call it a year, year two years ago um have you know a, a a plan to profitability um maybe not immediately but um certainly in, in the macro backdrop you know paying attention to what is the process to becoming profitable um, there, there's certainly a renewed emphasis on that. Jeremy, when it comes to venture capital investing, what would you say has been your greatest success and failure? And what would you say made the difference? I think really it, timing is crucial, right? Uh, a lot of you know investors can, can get lost in hype cycles, um, AI being the latest, um, before that, you know, self-driving cars, um, VR, AR, um, and, and there are these incredible technologies that, that come to market and everyone gets extremely excited and, you know, wheels start spinning on where you can apply this tech, um, really taking a, a practical approach on application um it, it, in my mind it is has been the the best success um you know and, and in crypto at least for for us you know we we did have a portfolio company that was caught up in, in the ftx um you know three arrows deleveraging um risk management and, and making sure you know not necessarily that this was the case uh, um with this particular you know company but um, having an understanding that, that the founders you're working with are, are you know, transparent, um, you know, upfront, uh, straightforward people um, that, you know, do their best to, to put risk management tools in place. You know, you, you can't always predict those black swan events, um, but knowing that they're at least putting their best foot forward, attempting to, you know, mitigate the those unforeseen risks that that may show up all righty cool guys we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back the matt brown show is presented by carafin an investment bank that offers and supports direct private investments in u.s operating companies over the past 20 years investors have placed over 1.2 billion dollars of private debt and equity in more than 100 companies through carafin and its affiliates Carafin leverages technology to empower its community of investors to deploy their capital far more efficiently than ever before and connects their community of engaged investors with worthy companies. Invest portions of your portfolio in direct private investments today. Visit carafin.com forward slash Matt Brown show for more. And we're back. Oh, well, we were. Jeremy. Are you there? <laughs> hey, I'm here. Okay, he is here, people. <laughs> so, uh, so Jeremy, um, when it comes to uh, capital structures, um, how do you have a preferred structure of capital? So, for instance, do you prefer safe notes when they're pre-revenue, convertible notes if they're revenue generating? Where does the rubber hit the road for you? Well, obviously, in, in our situation, we're also doing token investments. Um, in addition to some of those, you know, more traditional structures, um, I, I think a combination of equity and token is ideal for, for us, um, or an equity investment with a side letter that says, hey, if, you know, you issue a token down the road, um, there's some sort of proportional conversion um, to our equity stake. I, I think that's really ideal in crypto, right? 
Um, cause it's, it's very hard to tell at an early stage where the value is going to accrue, um, in, in crypto, you know, in a number of instances and in infrastructure products, it, it really doesn't make sense for, for the companies to be issuing tokens. Um, but you know, some of the, um, you know, lending, uh, you know, projects, it, it makes a lot more sense, right? Um, so it's, you know, case by case basis, but ideally, you know, a, a traditional safe note, but also a side letter with, with the optionality, you know, if, if there's a token down the road, uh, we get a piece of that. And Jeremy, when it comes to exits, how do you evaluate and prioritize them? Where do you sit uh, in terms of an invest, you know, a strategic acquirer comes along, some banks like, yo, we want to be open banking, decentralized finance, let's do it. And you're sitting with an investor or an investment in a startup that solves that problem. Um, and they're like, cool, we want to buy you guys. We love your IP. We can't build it ourselves. Uh, so <laughs> what happens then? Like walk us through how you or where you land on how you approach exit opportunities. Yeah, within the the crypto industry, right, there's only a, a certain amount of buyers. Um, the industry has only had, you know, call it a decade plus to, to really mature um, and, and, you know, build those companies that are in a position for, for M&A, right? Um, really the, you know, Coinbase, um, there are some other publicly listed, um, you know, companies in the U.S., but really exchange and infrastructure, the folks that have you know, made it to the IPO. Um, when we look at acquirers, it's, you know, traditional banks, um, traditional financial institutions in conjunction with, you know, the Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, um, those folks. Um, and, and really it's, I, I think, you know, over the next three to five years, there's going to be a significant amount of M&A um, in terms of traditional institutions that, you know, they've tried to, to build out crypto teams in-house um, and it hasn't really worked, right? A ton of ter turnover, corporate bureaucracy. Um, and, and I think once that point comes where they realize, okay, you know, we haven't been successful doing this in-house, Let's take an M&A approach, um, you know, call it three to five years from now. Um, and, and for us, you know, working with entrepreneurs, it's really, you know, what's in their best interest. Obviously, we want to see a financial return, but if they don't think it's a fit, we we won't push them one way or the other, right? They have to be okay with it. Um, if the board thinks it, you know, it, it makes sense, we'll encourage them to, you know, rethink that choice. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're in the business of backing founders and want them to to be in the driver's seat. Um, but yeah, that that's really how we are approaching it at the moment. So, Jeremy, we touched on um, you know a few things that are happening in the market that make things pretty much unpredictable. So, when it comes to the venture capital space, what keeps you up at night? Black Swan events like FCX, um, you know. The, the fallout from, from that was um, you know, not ideal. Uh, obviously, regulation is top of mind, right? Um, right now, especially with the, the recent banking shock, um, we're seeing you know, a choke point from crypto companies um, being able to access banking services um, and, and you know, what that means going forward. Um, there are certainly a number of companies in the U.S. that are gauging whether it makes the you know makes sense to go offshore, stay onshore. Um, I, I think in the next call it year to, to two and a half, three years out, uh, regulatory clarity will will be crucial to you know driving a lot of those decisions. Mm. Yeah, um, everybody gets upset until the regulators come, which is, by the way, in the crypto space, I think it's so important. Well, I think in general, <laughs> uh, you know, I think as these technologies evolve, like DeFi, for instance, like the regulators actually have to come and, and play because the, re the institutional money is not going to come until the regulators pitch up and actually start to drive the guardrails around the space. Um, because, you know, with, with FTX, for instance, there's just too many... It's, it's just too wild west at the moment. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I, I definitely, you know, welcome regulation. Um, I just hope they do it in a way that doesn't hinder innovation, um, especially with everything that's occurring in fractional banking right now. Um, I, I hope that, you know, DeFi gets a, a you know, spotlight, um, fully collateralized loans, um, you know, work very well, uh, the, comp- you know, compounds, Aves of the world, right? Even when uh, the centralized lenders and crypto blew up, their operations, you know, w- were unaffected. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, some of these traditional financial institutions recognize that the DeFi works and, um, you know, we'll start to see more and more volume move, move in that direction. Mm. So how do you see the role of venture capital evolving over the next 10 years or so? And what do you think its impacts will be for startups? In, in terms of funds, um, you know, I, I definitely think the established mega funds of the world um, will be able to continue being generalists, right? NEA, Sequoia, Graykoff, Excel, General Catalyst, A16Z. Um, but for smaller, medium-sized funds, uh, I really think we're going to see a um, specialization w- within venture funding. Um, we've already seen it in healthcare, right? Um, you know, you're not going to be a, a biotech VC with a B2B background. Um, it, it simply just doesn't happen. Um, and, and I think you know, specialization is going to continue to happen. Um, in VC, whether that's consumer focused products, um, you know, e commerce, um, th- there are just going to be different verticals and, you know, three or four VCs within each vertical that kind of dominate um, that space and, and really build out connections within the industry. Uh, I, I think that's one of the biggest trends we're going to see. Um, in terms of funding, um, you know, valuations are obviously down. Um, I think they will recover. Um, and then there's also this blending of other financial investors that are getting into VC. So it's going to become even more and more crowded, whether that's, you know, large hedge funds like Tiger um, and, and others that have, you know, obviously been investing in, in privates for the last few years. Um Sequoia now has a hybrid model. Um, they're able to to make you know investments in publicly traded companies. Um, so I think that you know force is is going to continue to evolve, and it's going to bring a lot more capital to the table. Um, secondary markets, um, I, I think, will become more and more efficient. Um, the price you know, disparity uh, in, in secondaries for you know late stage venture is a pretty large spectrum. So. Um, We'll, we'll see, you know, efficiency across the board and specialization. Awesome. So let's hope that all happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Jeremy, uh, let's wrap this up. If I gave you the keys to the Matt Brown Show time machine and asked you to go back to yourself on day one, no fun, you just wanted to get into the VC space, coming out of family office or whatever, maybe even go further back if you'd like. Um, but uh, what, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself about venture stage investing? I'd say, I mean, having a, a mentor w- would have, um, you know, I, I think from an early stage um, would have been crucial, um, you know, but really, I, I think VC, there's a lot of different paths that people take, um, you know, and, and end up here. Um, really, you just got to put yourself out there and, and talk to as many possible founders as you can. And Um, everyone, you know, brings some piece of learning to the table, um, whether you you think it or not. Um, so, you know, just having as many conversations as you possibly can. And, you know, I'm sure on your show, you, you've learned quite a bit, just, you know, hearing different perspectives, uh, of folks in the industry. So I I really think that's a a crucial part of learning and, um, you know, continuing to do that. But if I had started to do that a, a bit earlier, um, what would have been useful. Yeah, it's uh, hindsight's always a perfect science. 
Exactly. Well, dear Jeremy, thanks for being on the show, dude. <clears throat> I think it's cool that you're niching. I've, uh, I think one of the things I've, I have seen is that there's a lot of niche-specific funds out there, AI, protein transformation, blockchain crypto, where you are, um, and, and the likes. And so I think you're 100% correct there. Um, and I think it's a good thing. Like all the greatest things that have happened in my entrepreneurial journey have all come through niching. Um, and that's really what makes you different, right, is specialization because then all capital is no longer equal. Exactly. Hopefully it gives us an edge. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Alrighty, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Matt. Have a good one.